Okay. Okay. I guess we're ready. So uh, thank you all for coming along to see this uh, introduction to what I call the union components. So that will make multiple scattering simulations in MaxTest uh, a lot more powerful and simple. To start off with, uh, I just want to, to recap what it is in MaxTest that limits this capability normally. Um, we have in the upper part, uh, sort of a 3D layout of the instrument file, and the lower part, sort of the, the one-dimensional instrument file. And MaxTest generates the rays and propagates them through these components in a linear order. Um, but inside each component, we can have multiple scattering. The problem is that you cannot go back in this chain. So the user effectively have to know in advance in which order these components uh, are seen in the neutral point of view. And that's fine for, for example, a triple axis if we don't have anything close by each other. If we add some some other sample mass next to the sample, it becomes difficult for the user to know which one it will interact with first. So MaxDAS has this group statement, so you can interact with one of them, but they cannot interact with each other. So you cannot have a ray going into the first sample and then the second and back again. So that's the primary problem, that it is effectively a linear succession of spatially separated components. And the, it limits the multiple scattering, but it also uh, is also forbidden for components to overlap. It cannot handle that because each component assumes that the ray came from the outside. And all code for each component is, is isolated, which is a good thing because it, it gives the modularity. But for these sample components we have today, they're, they're becoming larger and larger, and it's becoming progressively harder to actually add to them because you need to understand everything that has happened before in order to explain. And in the other court, so to say, we have the, the experimental world. And what do we have issues out there? We have sample holders with complicated geometries. We have um, many different materials. Even if we could do this geometry with a single MAC test, sample today, we wouldn't be able to label the different parts with different properties. Uh, all of this needs to go inside of some sample environment. And then what if we have co-aligned crystals? It gets even worse and almost impossible. And then twinned crystals. We have multiple uh, different crystal axes in the crystal. And then we need multiple scattering between those as well. So, what I want to present today is my ideas and my code for overcoming these issues. And it's basically down to the thought of splitting up the classical sample component into uh, three parts. Into process components, geometry components, and a master component. And then you can have several processes and several geometries, and the master will then tie it all together. It has several um, clear advantages just for user input because the alternative is a really long input list and here you get a certain context that you know a width is something about a width of a distribution if it's a process but the width of an object if it's a geometry. Then it simplifies expandability because it's easier to add a new process component to all of this uh, than to try to incorporate it in an existing sample component. And it allows uh, a great deal of scalability because you can use as many of these components and then one master uh, to, to scale from small problems uh, to huge ones. Let's look at them in turn. First, the, the process components. What we describe is just a single physical process. For example, here in coherence scattering, uh, I call it aluminium incoherent because we are describing it for the aluminium constants. We can also add uh, a powder process for the aluminium, but these two are not connected yet. In order to connect them, um, we combine them to, with the make material that takes these two as uh, names, as inputs, 
And now we have something called aluminium that we can reference later uh, with a set of properties. And it will have the incoherent, the powder, and an absorption that we've defined in the MIG material. Currently, there is an incoherent, a powder, and a single crystal process available. It's so only elastic scattering so far, but there's nothing against adding uh, inelastic processes. Why do I allow stacking them in this way? Well, as I mentioned, the modular structure is important, but it also allows me to migrate so much complexity from the process components to the master component. For example, Monte Carlo choices and multiple scattering and all of this. So it simplifies making a process a lot. And then it can even be beneficial to use several instances of the same process on one sample. For example, by twinning a crystal or adding phonons to many frag peaks. Let's talk about the geometries. Um, they use these material definitions, of course. And the special thing is that they're not affected by whatever order they are in. So here's an example. I call this a cryostat shell, and we use a cylinder, and there's uh, some obvious dimensions, uh, and we use the material we defined before. Then I define uh, another one, which I call cryostat vacuum, that uses a vacuum material, which is predefined and just does nothing, and I place it almost in the same space, and that should make most of you cringe because you're not allowed to do that in MaxTest. But with this, you are. You can actually overlap things. So far, there's only a cylinder and a box. Um, so definitely, I need to add a few more. But it's actually will get us quite far. So let's try to build some complex geometries with this. Well, since they're allowed to overlap, we can do things like this in order to make more interesting shapes. But when, what about the region where they overlap? Um, the priority of these geometries decide which material is, a diff is a simulated in that region. Here, 3.7 is larger than 2, so it's on top. And putting in one more, we have an even more complicated geometry. And this is useful, because now we can make a simple cryostat by taking a massive chunk of aluminum and then sort of filling it up with vacuum and leaving a thin shell. Doing that again, we have the outer and the inner walls, and then adding some, some sample geometry. And that quickly uh, and easily gets you quite far. There are also some uh, masks. You can just have your, your geometry and then mask it with a mask geometry, and then only the dark shaded part will actually be simulated, which allows for even greater possibilities. The only issue here is and if you have two geometries which share uh, a plane and that they coincide, the algorithm breaks out. Mm. So that's the new illegal thing to do that will make the algorithm uh, produce errors. But just overlap them with a micrometer or so, and it's OK. And then we have this master component. And in there, there's actually a completely independent ray tracer that sort of redo everything MaxTest usually does because then I can make it without the underlying assumption of a linear uh, progression. So all these union components that we've defined before, they just forward all the information to this master, and then the master does all the simulation. All the other ones just had an empty trace section. Um, and this just allows it to do the multiple scattering within all the geometries and between them. And it has almost no input parameters, so you just Define that in the end, and remember to define it, otherwise nothing will happen. So let's go back to sort of reality and see how far we've we gotten. Well, now we can do something like this instead, which uh, is a large improvement over what we've been doing so far. It's just uh, replicated from the picture, uh, but very easy to assemble. And we can have each the little part of this have its own material definition. And if we take it into MaxTest, we can get uh, things like an absorption picture. Uh, and we see that the order of the components didn't matter because we can see all these aluminum rings and so on. I just exaggerated the aluminum scattering here in comparison to the sample, so it's all easier to see. Let's now look at 
how is such a master behaves in a regular max dash file. Well, the arrays are generated as normal, and then they enter this master component, and they're just stuck there for some time. And then when they leave, it's handed back to the classical MaxDAS, and it just continues in the instrument. So you can use it within existing instruments by just dropping it in, no problems there. But what goes on inside of such a master component? Um, well, here we see sort of the different geometries, the different colors, and the network between them. And if you follow array, it goes in there and follows this path. On, and it will just continue to propagate around in this network until it doesn't find any intersections anymore, and then it's out. The problem here is that this, of course, requires a lot of computation power. So what the master component does is that the analyzes the entire geometry uh, and finds out which of these links are actually irrelevant. For example, you can't go from the outside and into the sample without crossing the walls. So taking that into account, it removes all the unnecessary calculations, and we're left with a much simpler network, and that's what's used during the trace algorithm, which speeds <coughs> it up by a lot. Here from the order of 56 connections to 11, so something closer to linear rather than quadratic. And I suspect that was the original argument for making max as linear, to have a linear computation time instead of quadratic. Now we can start building something with these uh, components. And here on the left, we have the current geometry, and on the right, uh, a time of flight diagram. And we see the um, powder peaks, you know, I gave it a powder definition, the uh, NASCAL standard sample, and we already see some multiple scattering as we would in MaxDAS already. If we add some of the aluminum wire to keep it onto the sample environment, we see the powder peaks from aluminum occurring in there, and a bit more delayed scattering because it took a longer time to get through. And then we add this little chip the sample had that was used to mount it, and it just removes some of the very lowest parts. By adding um, the start of the sample holder, we start to get some uh, delayed results in this banana detector. Still not very much, but at least when we add more of the sample holder, it doesn't change by a lot because now we're out of the direct beam and uh, no more issues from that. We can even add the um, the entire uh, sample stick to the to this just because we can. It doesn't change uh, a lot outside. But things get really interesting when we add the inner vacuum chamber of the cryostat. I said it's a little laggy, but we can still see what geometry we have. And here we have some echoes from the scattering, so to say. We have some multiple scattering around in there, and a very complicated diagram. But when we add the outer shell, it gets even worse. And we have some very complicated scattering that is delayed by sort of half a millisecond, uh, and it's getting really significant. And MaxDAS is now capable of simulating that in great detail. I think it's, it's funny to just uh, deconstruct it again, click back and forth between them and see on the same scale to see what was added. And that the sample stack actually did have a small influence, but only very slight. And then we are back down to um, what we have currently in MaxDAS. And now, of course, the question is, how do we understand all this data? Because uh, it's suddenly very complicated to understand what's going on inside your simulation. And the first line of defense for that is uh, the tagging system. Um, all histories of the arrays are recorded and sorted. And by history, I mean, for example, entered the wall, made a scattering there, uh, and then left again. So it doesn't matter where, but the order of these operations matter. And the, the top line, we just see array going straight through everything. Uh, but in the next line, we actually see a scattering. And that's the one we usually are interested in. And then we can see exactly how much of the final intensity is made up from that. 
And then we have thousands and thousands of other alternative histories which are nasty background in some way. So if you want to look for a particular one, you can write it out, search for it, and see how much intensity that actually contributes with. The next line of defense is these uh, logger components. Uh, and they fulfill sort of a desire for understanding what goes on inside of the master component instead of only the final neutral state. Uh, and here we have uh, an example of such a logger. It, it logs the, the time of scattering. And we put some maximum and minimum of the histogram and, and also a, a little condition on what happened in the scattering moment. This one only looks at the second order scattering, for example. But it can only apply conditions to what happened in the scattering moment. Currently, I have a, a one dimensional time and momentum transfer uh, and space loggers uh, in a few different dimensionalities. They're easy to write. Let's look at some of the data for, for this particular experiment. We have the scattering time here, and we can, of course, specify all these different um, properties. For example, if you only want to look in the aluminum or things like that. Um, or here, there are for the different orders of scattering. And the first scattering obviously happens in the direct beam, but the next is much more complicated. But we see it rings out at some time because, of course, you need to scatter a third time if you want to keep being inside of the sample environment. Uh, otherwise, you'd have a, a very set lifetime. And then we have uh, the um, 2D position. This is from viewing up top down into the uh, prior style, and we can see the sample in the middle. And all of these lines are powder lines from the walls and the sample. Um, shown mostly in the thick mounting plate on the bottom of the plaster. And this is a monochromatic 5 milli electron volt beam going in from this direction here. But let's, look, let's look at it in terms of the first, second, and third order scattering again. We see the first happens in the direct line of the beam, then the second has a lot of structure, and the third is more diffuse. Then on to uh, momentum transfer. And that's actually a surprising amount of complexity that I didn't expect. It's, it's difficult to understand with all the different uh, orders in one. But again, we look at them in the first, second, and third order. We see that the first, we, we knew the initial wave vector. So we have a, a nicely defined area uh, in the response space. Uh, and we see the aluminum lines and the uh, power lines from NASCAL. And it's because you see them from, from up down top that they look like a line, even though we have sort of a, a powder ring. The second scattering uh, has all this structure because it's probably two different powder lines that the rays interacted with. So we see different radii uh, and a funny and uh, sensitive distribution. And then again, the third scattering is much more diffuse. But you can see it scatters back and forth in the cryostat because it's alternate which side has the most intensity, which is interesting. And now for uh, a short movie showing what goes on in the time spectrum. So we go from the beam hitting the sample or the, the cryostat, and then all the scattering expands out. This is from the top, from the side, and from the front. And here's the final wave vector. And we see a surprising amount of complexity as all of these secondary scattering goes around. And even all of these are small bracket reflections from, or die by share cones from the scattered intensity of the sample. If we just grab control of it here, we can see some of the interesting times. Oh, still going. There's a surprisingly long uh, time where there's one lingers. But it's about 1.1 millisecond. All of this happens so over. Let's let's just look at some key moments here. Here we uh, we hit the inner wall, and we can see the processes up in the right corner, hitting the sample the first time. 
Now all these reflections from the sample hit the inner walls so we can see them. And they start hitting the outer walls. We can see that it is actually cones projected onto the cylinder. And then the secondary ones, they went through the inner chamber again uh, and made this bunch of small cones on the opposite side. Okay, but now I sort of get how the time of flight diagram came to be that complicated. But if I want to look at a smaller part of it and understand what contributed to that exact part of it, I need to filter by the final state of the neutron. And that's where these conditional components come in. Um, we have a defined larger component, and then one attaches this conditional component by using the, um, the name as a reference, and you can add as many as you want, no problem. And then I add uh, a final time uh, as a condition. And the logger will not only record the information if that is fulfilled. Currently, uh, there's just the standard one that does time and one for uh, a position in space. So now we can, we can look at our octave background here and select one little peak here. And these conditionals can actually be accessed in the extent section, so we can use a, a regular max test monitor to confirm what kind of uh, peak we got a hold of, and we found the right one. Let's first look at it in terms of um, momentum transfer. We see a big mess of when we see all gathering orders at one time, but in um, in the first, second, and third order, it's much easier to see what's going on. The first scattering seems to be uh, backscattering. The small line at the very end is the most intense. The next one has a few contributions, at least three lines, and then a longer one that's a, a secondary scattering for um, on two different aluminum power lines. We still don't know where it went on, though. So if we see the spatial distribution, we say, ah, okay, for the first scattering, it's most intense at the back wall. So the rate travel all the way through the sample and the three other walls first. Then it's scattered back all the way to the first wall again. And there's some intensity at the sample too. It looks a little weird. The third scattering is more diffuse again. And actually, um, the amount of rays that got that is in this third scattering part is, is much lower than the two first, so uh, it's mainly a second order effect. And once again, we can play an animation with just the rays that enter that particular peak. Around here, we hit the back wall. And there we see those three lines and the little speck that made it there. Let's try to look at that again. This is the frame, the exact time where it happens. And it, since the, the peak is almost 90 degrees to um, the cryostat, the rays from these two places can actually make it to the same point of the banana monitor uh, at the same time, even though some are from the center and some are from the edge. So there was actually several peaks overlapping by just sort of coincidence. And then uh, we wondered if, uh, if, if I had chosen 5 milli electron volt and just was really unlucky or not. It was actually some other people that decided this wavelength because that was what they worked with in the experiment I was participating in. So let's try to scan it. We see the energy up in the right corner. And actually, just at 5 milli electron volts, it gets a lot worse. And that's because of this um, peaks in aluminum disappear just below 5 milli electron volts. If we look at just the right frame, here we go. That's the one we know. This one is a little higher energy. And if we go down a little bit, this is a little lower. So we lose all this back and forth that happens when uh, the two theta is approximately 180 degrees. 
So I was particularly unlucky here, but it's still evident that multiple scattering is annoying for all energies. And then a final word on the expandability of the code. Um, it's of course modular, so it, en it invites to collaboration. And if we define sort of a coding difficulty scale going from a max dash monitor to a max dash sample, we can sort of plot in how hard I think they are. All of them are harder to code than a regular monitor because they require that you sort of register them in a, in a C union inside a certain file. But the uh, conditionals and the loggers are fairly simple. Then the union process is um, in what, somewhere between a monitor and a sample. Uh, and that's the one I was focusing on making as easy as possible. But then we have the geometry, which is still rather difficult because I need uh, functions that determine if two different geometries overlap. So it becomes a growing problem the more geometries we have, the more different kinds of these functions I need. So it will be, become more difficult with time. And I'm thinking about how to make that easier, but not yet. Um, but this lowering of the, the barrier of entry uh, on physics means that we're already getting students uh, that are interested in, in making such a process, which will be a great help. And then a word about performance. Of course, uh, Monte Carlo simulations are often limited by computing power, um, but here in this class that examples, it only took three seconds to run the standard one million race through, which I'm quite proud about. But even though there is a large focus on performance, the most important thing to me personally is the scalability of it. I want to scale well with larger amounts of geometry. So to demonstrate how well I've done that, then uh, I have uh, uh, as part of my stay abroad, simulated the max instrument at NIST. And here we have the, the wonderful monochromator. It, uh, it has 357 single crystals. Uh, it's pyrolytic graphite. And they're mounted on these arches that are compressed in order to get the focusing condition fulfilled. And then there's these support around it that will also create some um, additional power lines. And all of this can be simulated in a, on a laptop in reasonable time, but of course, some more than three seconds. And then we have the sample we know and the cryostat is on this uh, instrument. And on this one, I also show the entire backend that I've also done with this union components. And this was a much larger project. It actually is more than 600 of these uh, geometries. Each of the different channels has its own double analyzer set up with collimators in between, and the analyzers are even vertically focusing. Um, and I had CAT models of all of this, so I could sit and, and put my geometries exactly as reality and uh, get a very comprehensive simulation. And here, all of these channels have crosstalk. You can go through the shielding and, and go to the next channel and that, that is something that happens, uh, but of course with very, very low probability. And this is still something that I can run on a laptop and, and have useful results. Of course, if you want to scan like A3 or something like that, then putting it on a cluster is much more convenient, but it's still uh, it's useful data from just a laptop. So uh, an outlook here at the end. I've selected to split it into two. What, what do I want to do in terms of development and what do I want to do in terms of use of this or hope others will do? Of course, adding more processes and geometries is essential, but I also want to give the, the Lagna components access to transmission so that absorption can be monitored and so on. And then a big thing for me would be uh, surface effects. So we get a refraction index on all the geometries and then we have refraction, but also super mirrors and so on. So we can have small guides inside our sample environment if we want. And then gravity. At this point, it's just uh, linear propagation, and gravity ignored within the sample environment. In terms of use, it's also quite exciting as this can very easily be put to use to design sample environments. Uh, of course, instrument design. 
check for some of these unpredictable paths, um, and even experiment planning. I already showed how important it is to select the proper energy uh, to minimize this multiple scattering. And virtual experiments, which really can get a boost from this. Uh, and at the end, uh, data analysis, when it becomes sufficiently realistic that you can actually use it to understand the data after an experiment. And that's the most ambitious, ambitious one. And at the end here, a uh, conclusion. I presented this uh, collection of union components that will provide a new framework within MaxFAS uh, and can grow with contributions. It, it differentiates itself by allowing multiple scattering between every geometry and within all of them and between all of the processes. And I think it's important to mention that it lowers this barrier of entry uh, into writing physics functions for MaxFAS. And of course, it's easy to learn and easy to install for existing MaxDash users. You just drop this bunch of components <laughs> to your work directory and that's all. And I think it will have quite an immediate impact on, on design and virtual experiments. And uh, it will be available in MaxDash 2.4 with an extensive manual. And if you're really keen on using it earlier than that, contact me and you can get a, a working copy. And then with that, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. So, so uh, of course, uh, really, really nice work. And uh, as, as uh, Ness has mentioned already, it will be in the next Ness test release. It's actually already sitting in the GitHub repository if you want to just check out uh, the components from there. So, so I, I would, uh, I would on the other hand, I would like to soften maybe your wording okay. uh, in the initial wording about what is possible and not uh, with, with the existing uh, uh, code in, in mm -hmm. Um you, you may say that that is certainly not accessible to the average mm -hmm. MaxDash user to do these kinds of things. On the other hand, uh, the freedom to uh, to essentially uh, write this this uh, uh, level of uh, Crosstalk between components is still. I mean, it's not impossible to do okay. in C in, in, uh, in the instrument file that has been has been done. Right? Yeah. Um, but but this certainly lowers the uh, uh, let's say the threshold to achieve uh, something but, like this. But how would you create the multiple scattering between different processes, for example? This is of course true. Uh, that's in that's in that's that sense, yes, it's true. Not it's true. true. It, 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 it extends capability, but but terms of, of breaking. Uh, linearity or scattering among, let's yeah. say, uh, they would still have to be, uh, what do you say, yeah, independent blocks of, of matter. This is yeah. this is certainly possible to do. Yeah, of course you can get somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, did you compare your version of multiple scattering, let's say, for just one isolated sample, with those already in next test? Yes, perfectly. Mm -hmm. With the, at least with the three that I have found. And they are more or less lifted the, the physics part from um, from the existing components, so they should agree. Um, but the multiple scattering also, and the absorption and so on, everything is uh, validated. So, do I remember correctly? Were you in Coimbra for the CIMA 2020 meeting? No, no. No. no, but the the sample environment task in CIMA 2020 <laughs> aspires to put effort on simulating sample environments and have promised to do that within a MaxDash framework. So this might actually be a good solution, especially uh, Victor Laliena from uh, from Saragossa is is doing things within Elastics already. And it might be that what he should be doing is putting effort on putting uh, such processes into your framework. So you should clearly talk to him. I, I, I forwarded the information, but apparently he, he didn't have the time to, to participate here. But yeah, if, if we have the recording, he should have access for sure. Hmm. So at the beginning, you, you mentioned the priorities that are assigned to the geometries. How, how are they assigned? Is it like a arbitrary that you have to choose them? Or that's like if they get cut file, for example, can you make this priority 
Um, well, you, you assign them uh, when you so when you put in the command. Yeah, uh, because um, I cannot in any way predict uh, if you want a lower or higher priority than what's already there. Mm -hmm. Unless it's a complete enclosed within something, then I obviously know you want it higher than what's it enclosed in, because otherwise it would just be completely gone. But other than that, I cannot know in advance how the user wants to uh, layer these things. So it's something the user provides. Can we compare the simulated output with no? Not yet. It's, uh, um, we obviously have the possibility to do so with the max instrument, uh, and we've done some, some early qualitative comparison, and we do see some multiple scattering effect that they that they didn't know what, where, where they were coming from, and we saw them here as well, but we haven't quantitatively compared yet. But it will be very exciting to do so. Can you, uh, can you simulate a time of light spectrometer? Of course, one could. Because I know some time of light spectrometer very well. I think I know the background function, but it would be interesting to see the comparison. Yeah, and you have access to the data. Oh yeah, it's all the data. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Control the sampling line and remember. <laughs> That's really cool. May I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's very, it's really impressive work. It's, it's brilliant. Um, so from what you were showing there, for, from your, your cryostat with its radiation shield and the like, do you have a feeling for uh, if you were to introduce a radial collimator, for example, what's the best way of doing that? Is it having it outside the sample environment or inside or having larger grid patterns and things like that? Do you have any sense of that, how that well, might we uh, certainly, be optimized? We certainly see that for energies where we have almost backscattering, uh, from the aluminium, um, it would be necessary to have a fairly fine collimator within between the two levels of the cryostat. Uh, otherwise, I think most of uh, what we are left with can actually get through uh, a, cry uh, a radial collimator mounted on the outside. Um, but it's so easy to check by just putting in at least the one on the outside. Putting it inside would require to define a geometry for each separate blade. Uh, which is not that efficient, but certainly possible. Yeah. So uh, another comment. So uh, I guess you're probably writing this up uh, for a proper publication. So one one uh, suggestion uh, that I mean, of course, it's not experimental validation or anything like that, but it it would be good to actually have a graph that would show you, uh, let's say, a simple, the simplest as possible. Uh, powder pattern, and then you know, with these various noise uh, contributions from, yeah, from from the imperfections of, of the system to see what what yeah. the qualitative uh, difference, well, the quantitative really yeah. difference is. Certainly, it's, uh, I mean, of, of course, these graphs are, are clear. They show that there are a lot of effects that are there that we yeah, don't yeah. think about uh, typically, but but this would would add. Uh, I certainly see one. And know, it's a range of importance, maybe. Right? Certainly. Uh, there's a lot to be done with this tool. Uh, I just focused on getting it done and getting it ready until my contract runs out. Uh, and now it's really <laughs> up to, uh, to the entire community. I wanted to share it as, as fast as possible, um, which I think is, is the current condition of the code with a reasonable manual and, uh, and time to seek collaboration. Simply. So if that's all the questions, I'll try to stop this uh, recording. <laughs>